Section 1 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. Publius Cornelius Scipio. To His Army Before Battle, 218 B.C. Footnote. Delivered on the eve of Ticino, fought near the present Vercelli in North Italy in 218 B.C. Reported by Levy, Spillen and Edmonds translation. End of footnote. Born in unknown year B.C., died in 212. Defeated by Hannibal at the Ticino and the Trebia in 218 B.C. Destroyed the fleet of Carthage in 217, thus gaining for Rome the mastery of the sea. Afterward gained other victories. Finally defeated and slain in battle, father of the elder Scipio Africanus. If, soldiers, I were leading out that army to battle which I had with me in Gaul, I should have thought it superfluous to address you. For of what use would it be to exhort either those horsemen who so gloriously vanquished the cavalry of the enemy at the river Rhone, or those legions with whom, pursuing this very enemy flying before us, I obtained, in lieu of victory, a confession of superiority, shown by his retreat and refusal to fight? Now, because that army, levied for the province of Spain, maintains the war under my auspices, and the command of my brother, Nuis Scipio, in the country where the Senate and people of Rome wished him to serve. And since I, that you might have a consul for your leader against Hannibal and the Carthaginians, have offered myself voluntarily for this contest, few words are required to be addressed from a new commander to soldiers unacquainted with him. That you may not be ignorant of the nature of the war, nor of the enemy, you have to fight, soldiers, with those whom in the former war you conquered, both by land and sea, from whom you have exacted tribute for twenty years, from whom you hold Sicily and Sardinia, taken as prizes of victory. In the present contest, you and they will have those feelings which are wont to belong to the victors and the vanquished. Nor are they now about to fight, because they are daring but because it is unavoidable. Except you can believe that they who declined the engagement when their forces were entire should have now gained more confidence when two-thirds of their infantry and cavalry have been lost in the passage of the Alps, and when almost greater numbers have perished than survive. Yes, they are few indeed, some may say, but they are vigorous in mind and body, men whose strength and power scarce any force may withstand. On the contrary, they are but the resemblances, nay, are rather the shadows of men, being worn out with hunger, cold, dirt, and filth, and bruised and enfeebled among stones and rocks. Besides all this, their joints are frostbitten, their sinews stiffened with the snow, their limbs withered up by the frost, their armor battered and shivered, their horses lame and powerless. With such cavalry, with such infantry, you have to fight. You will not have enemies in reality, but rather their last remains. And I fear nothing more than that when you have fought Hannibal, the Alps may appear to have conquered him. But perhaps it was fitting that the gods themselves should, without any human aid, commence and carry forward a war with a leader and a people that violate the faith of treaties, and that we, who next to the gods have been injured, should finish the contest thus commenced and nearly completed. I do not fear, lest any one should think that I say this ostentatiously, for the sake of encouraging you, 
while in my own mind I am differently affected. I was at liberty to go with my army into Spain, my own province, for which I had already set out, where I should have had a brother as the sharer of my counsels and my dangers, and Hasdrubal instead of Hannibal for my antagonist, and without question a less laborious war. Nevertheless, as I sailed along the coast of Gaul, having landed on hearing of this enemy, and having sent forward the cavalry, I moved my camp to the Rhone. In a battle of cavalry, with which part of my forces was afforded the opportunity of engaging, I routed the enemy, and because I could not overtake by land his army of infantry, which was rapidly hurried away as if in flight, having returned to the ships with all the speed I could, after compassing such an extent of sea and land, I have met him at the foot of the Alps. Whether do I appear, while declining the contest, to have fallen in unexpectedly with this dreaded foe, or to encounter him in his track, to challenge him and drag him out to decide the contest? I am anxious to try whether the earth has suddenly, in these twenty years, sent forth a new race of Carthaginians, or whether these are the same who fought at the islands Ayagates, and whom you permitted to depart from Eryx, valued at eighteen denarii a head, and whether this Hannibal be, as he himself gives out, the rival of the expeditions of Hercules, or one left by his father the tributary and tax subject and slave of the Roman people, who, did not his guilt at Saguntum drive him to frenzy, would certainly reflect, if not upon his conquered country, at least on his family and his father, and the treaties written by the hand of Hamilcar, who at the command of our consul withdrew the garrison from Eryx, who, indignant and grieving, submitted to the harsh conditions imposed on the conquered Carthaginians, who agreed to depart from Sicily and pay tribute to the Roman people. Saguntum, footnote, a city in Spain in alliance with Rome. In violation of a treaty, Hannibal had laid siege to it, and after eight months captured it. End of footnote. I would have you fight, not only with that spirit with which you are wont to encounter other enemies, but with a certain indignation and resentment as if you saw your slaves suddenly taking up arms against you. We might have killed them when shut up in Eryx by hunger, the most dreadful of human tortures. We might have carried over our victorious fleet to Africa, and in a few days have destroyed Carthage without any opposition. We granted pardon to their prayers. We released them from the blockade. We made peace with them when conquered and we afterward considered them under our protection when they were oppressed by the African War. In return for these benefits, they come under the conduct of a furious youth to attack our country. And I wish that the contest on your side was for glory and not for safety. It is not about the possession of Sicily and Sardinia, concerning which the dispute was formerly, but for Italy, that you must fight, nor is there another army behind, which if we should not conquer, can resist the enemy, nor are there other Alps, during the passage of which fresh forces may be procured. Here, soldiers, we must make our stand, as if we fought before the walls of Rome. Let every one consider that he defends with his arms not only his own person, but his wife and young children. Nor let him only entertain domestic cares and anxieties, but at the same time let him revolve in his mind that the Senate and the people of Rome now anxiously regard our efforts, and that according as our strength and valor shall be, such henceforward will be the fortune of that city and of the Roman Empire. Footnote it was in the Battle of Ticino that danger to the life of Scipio, as Levy says, 
was warded off by the interposition of his son, then just arriving at the age of puberty, the youth being the same to whom the glory of finishing this war belongs, and to whom the name of Africanus was given on account of his splendid victory over Hannibal and the Carthaginians. End of section 1《Section 2 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. Hannibal, Addressed to His Soldiers. Footnote delivered on the eve of Ticino in 218 B.C., reported by Levy, Spillen and Edmund's translation. A Latin oration, in the sense that Levy reproduced in Latin form and spirit what he had been told that Hannibal said to his soldiers. End of footnote. Born in 247 B.C., died about 183 went to Spain with his father in 238, succeeded Hasdrubal in 221, completed the conquest of Spain in 219, gained the battles of Ticino, Trebia, Trasimene, and Canae in Italy in 218 to 216, marched against Rome in 211, recalled to Africa in 203, defeated by Scipio Africanus at Zama in 202, exiled about 195, committed suicide. If, soldiers, you shall by and by, in judging of your own fortune, preserve the same feelings which you experienced a little before in the example of the fate of others, we have already conquered. For neither was that merely a spectacle, but, as it were, a certain representation of your condition. And I know not whether fortune has not thrown around you still stronger chains and more urgent necessities than around your captives. On the right and left two seas enclose you, without your possessing even a single ship for escape. The river Po around you, the Po larger and more impetuous than the Rhone, the Alps behind, scarcely passed by you when fresh and vigorous, hem you in. Here, soldiers, where you have first met the enemy, you must conquer or die. And the same fortune which has imposed the necessity of fighting holds out to you, if victorious, rewards than which men are not wont to desire greater, even from the immortal gods. If we were only about to recover by our valor Sicily and Sardinia, wrested from our fathers, the recompense would be sufficiently ample. But whatever, acquired and amassed by so many triumphs the Romans possess, all, with its masters themselves, will become yours. To gain this rich reward, hasten then and seize your arms with the favor of the gods. Long enough in pursuing cattle among the desert mountains of Lusitania and Celtiberia, you have seen no emolument from so many toils and dangers. It is time to make rich and profitable campaigns, and to gain the great reward of your labors, after having accomplished such a length of journey over so many mountains and rivers, and so many nations in arms. Footnote. Lusitania. Now called Portugal. End of footnote. Here fortune has granted you the termination of your labors. Here she will bestow a reward worthy of the service you have undergone. Nor in proportion as the war is great in name, ought you to consider that the victory will be difficult. A despised enemy has often maintained a sanguinary contest, and renowned states and kings have been conquered by a very slight effort. For, Setting aside only the splendor of the Roman name, what remains in which they can be compared to you? To pass over in silence your service for twenty years, distinguished by such valor and success, you have made your way to this place 
from the pillars of Hercules, from the ocean and the remotest limits of the world, advancing victorious through so many of the fiercest nations of Gaul and Spain. You will fight with a raw army, which this very summer was beaten, conquered, and surrounded by the Gauls, as yet unknown to its general, and ignorant of him. Shall I compare myself, almost born and certainly bred in the tent of my father, that most illustrious commander, myself the subjugator of Spain and Gaul, the conqueror too not only of the Alpine nations, but, what is much more, of the Alps themselves, with this six months general, the deserter of his army, to whom, if any one, having taken away their standards, should today show the Carthaginians and Romans, I am sure that he would not know of which army he was consul. Footnote. At the age of nine, Hannibal had begged his father to take him with him in a campaign from Carthage to Spain. Before going, he swore on the altar of sacrifice eternal enmity to Rome. End of footnote. I do not regard it, soldiers, as of small account that there is not a man among you before whose eyes I have not often achieved some military exploit, and to whom, in like manner, I, the spectator and witness of his valor, could not recount his own gallant deeds, particularized by time and place. With soldiers who have a thousand times received my praises and gifts, I, who was the pupil of you all before I became your commander, will march out in battle array against those who are unknown to and ignorant of each other. On whatever side I turn my eyes, I see nothing but what is full of courage and energy. A veteran infantry, cavalry, both those with and those without the bridle, composed of the most gallant nations. You, our most faithful and valiant allies, you Carthaginians, who are about to fight as well for the sake of your country as from the justice resentment. We are the assailants in the war, and descend into Italy with hostile standards, about to engage so much more boldly and bravely than the foe, as the confidence and courage of the assailants are greater than those of him who is defensive. Besides, suffering, injury, and indignity inflame and excite our minds. They first demanded me, your leader, for punishment, and then all of you who have laid siege to Saguntum, and had we been given up, they would have visited us with the severest tortures. That most cruel and haughty nation considers everything its own, and at its own disposal, it thinks it right that it should regulate with whom we are to have war, with whom peace. It circumscribes and shuts us up by the boundaries of mountains and rivers which we must not pass, and then does not adhere to those boundaries which it appointed. Pass not the Iberus, have nothing to do with the Saguntines. Saguntum is on the Iberus, you must not move a step in any direction. Is it a small thing that you take away my most ancient provinces, Sicily and Sardinia? Will you take Spain also? And should I withdraw thence, you will cross over into Africa. Will cross, did I say. They have sent the two consuls of this year, one to Africa, the other to Spain. There is nothing left to us in any quarter except what we can assert to ourselves by arms. Those may be cowards and dastards who have something to look back upon, whom flying through safe and unmolested roads their own lands and their own country will receive. There is a necessity for you to be brave, and, since all between victory and death is broken off from you by inevitable despair, either to conquer, or, if fortune should waver, to meet death rather in battle than in flight. If this be well fixed and determined in the minds of you all, I will repeat, you have already conquered. No stronger incentive to victory has been given to man by the immortal gods. End of section 2 
Section 3 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. Cato the Censor. In Support of the Oppian Law. Footnote. Delivered in the Roman Forum in 215 B.C. Reported by Levy, Spillan and Edmonds Translation. The Oppian Law, which had been enacted during the heat of the Punic War, declared that no woman should possess more than half an ounce of gold, or wear a garment of various colors, or ride in a carriage drawn by horses in a city or in a town, or any place nearer thereto than one mile except on occasions of some public religious solemnity. Levy describes the scene in Rome on the day of Cato's speech. The capital was filled with crowds who favored or opposed the law. Nor could the matrons be kept at home either by advice or shame, nor even by the commands of their husbands. But they beset every street and pass in the city, beseeching the men as they went down to the forum, that in the present flourishing state of the commonwealth, when the private fortune of all was daily increasing, they would suffer the women to have their former ornaments restored. This throng of women increased daily, for they arrived even from the country towns and villages, and they had at length the boldness to come up to the consuls, praetors, and magistrates to urge their request. One of the consuls, however, they found especially inexorable. Marcus Porcius Cato. After the discussion was ended, Levy says, the women next day poured out into the public in much greater numbers, and in a body beset the doors of the tribunes who had protested against the measure of their colleagues. Nor did they return until their intervention was withdrawn. The law was then repealed, in the twentieth year after it was made. In Smith's Dictionary, we are told how the women evince their exultation and triumph by going in procession through the streets and the forum, bedizened with their now legitimate finery. End of footnote. Born in 234 B.C., died in 149. Consul in 195. Censor in 184. Sent to Carthage in 150. Of Cato's orations, numbering at least a hundred and fifty, only fragments have been preserved. If, Romans, every individual among us had made it a rule to maintain the prerogative and authority of a husband with respect to his own wife, we should have less trouble with the whole sex. But now our privileges, overpowered at home by female contumacy, are even here in the forum spurned and trodden underfoot. And because we are unable to withstand each separately, we now dread their collective body. I was accustomed to think it a fabulous and fictitious tale that in a certain island the whole race of males was utterly extirpated by a conspiracy of the women. But the utmost danger may be apprehended equally from either sex if you suffer cabals and secret consultations to be held. Scarcely indeed can I determine in my own mind whether the act itself or the precedent that it affords is of more pernicious tendency. The latter of these more particularly concerns us consuls and the other magistrates. The former, you, my fellow citizens, for whether the measure proposed to your consideration be profitable to the state or not, is to be determined by you, who are to vote on the occasion. As to the outrageous behavior of these women, whether it be merely an act of their own, or, owing to your instigations, Marcus Fundanius and Lucius Valerius, it unquestionably implies culpable conduct in magistrates. I know not whether it reflects greater disgrace on you, tribunes, or on the consuls, on you, certainly, if you have brought these women hither for the purpose of raising tribunitian seditions. 
on us if we suffer laws to be imposed on us by a secession of women, as was done formerly by that of the common people. It was not without painful emotions of shame that I, just now, made my way into the forum through the midst of a band of women. Had I not been restrained by the respect for the modesty and dignity of some individuals among them, rather than of the whole number, and been unwilling that they should be seen rebuked by a consul, I should not have refrained from saying to them, What sort of practice is this, of running out into public, besetting the streets and addressing other women's husbands? Could not each have made the same request to her husband at home? Are your blandishments more seducing in public than in private, and with other women's husbands than with your own? Although, if females would let their modesty confine them within the limits of their own rights, it did not become you, even at home, to concern yourselves about any laws that might be passed or repealed here. Our ancestors thought it not proper that women should perform any, even private business, without a director, but that they should be even under the control of parents, brothers, or husbands. We, it seems, suffer them now to interfere in the management of state affairs, and to thrust themselves into the forum, into general assemblies, and into assemblies of election. For what are they doing at this moment in your streets and lanes? What but arguing, some in support of the motion of tribunes, others contending for the repeal of the law? Will you give the reins to their intractable nature? and then expect that themselves should set bounds to their licentiousness, and without your interference? This is the smallest of the injunctions laid on them by usage or the laws, all which women bear with impatience. They long for either liberty, nay, to speak the truth, not for liberty, but for unbounded freedom in every particular. For what will they not attempt if they now come off victorious? Recollect all the institutions respecting the sex, by which our forefathers restrained their profligacy, and subjected them to their husbands. And yet, even with the help of all these restrictions, they can scarcely be kept within bounds. If, then, you suffer them to throw these off one by one, to tear them all asunder, and at last to be set on an equal footing with yourselves, can you imagine that they will be any longer tolerable? Suffer them once to arrive at an equality with you, and they will from that moment become your superiors. But, indeed, they only object to any new law being made against them. They mean to deprecate, not justice, but severity. Nay, their wish is that a law which you have admitted established by your suffrages, and found in the practice and experience of so many years to be beneficial, should now be repealed, and that by abolishing one law you should weaken all the rest. No law perfectly suits the convenience of every member of the community. The only consideration is whether, on the whole, it be profitable to the greater part. If, because a law proves obnoxious to a private individual, it must therefore be cancelled and annulled. To what purpose is it for the community to enact laws, which those whom they were particularly intended to comprehend could presently repeal? Let us, however, inquire what this important affair is which has induced the matrons thus to run out into public in this indecorous manner, scarcely restraining from pushing into the forum and the assembly of the people. Is it to solicit that their parents, their husbands, children, and brothers may be ransomed from captivity under Hannibal? By no means. And far be ever from the commonwealth so unfortunate a situation. Yet when such was the case, you refuse this to the prayers which on that occasion their duty dictated. But it is not duty, nor solicitude for their friends. It is religion that has collected them together. They are about to receive the Idean mother, coming out of Phrygia from Pacinus. 
What motive that even common decency will not allow to be mentioned is pretended for this female insurrection? Hear the answer. That we may shine in gold and purple, that both on festival and common days we may ride through the city in our chariots, triumphing over vanquished and abrogated law, after having captured and wrested from you your suffrages, and that there may be no bounds to our expenses and our luxury. Often you have heard me complain of the profuse expenses of the women, often of those of the men, and that not only of men in private stations, but of the magistrates, and that the state was endangered by two opposite vices, luxury and avarice, those pests which have ever been the ruin of every state. These I dread the more, as the circumstances of the commonwealth grow daily more prosperous and happy, as the empire increases, as we have passed over into Greece and Asia, places abounding with every kind of temptation that can inflame the passions, and as we have begun to handle even royal treasures, for I greatly fear that these matters will rather bring us into captivity than we them. Believe me, those statues from Syracuse made their way into this city with hostile effect. I already hear too many commending and admiring the decorations of Athens and Corinth, and ridiculing the earthen images of our Roman gods that stand on the fronts of their temples. For my part, I prefer these gods, propitious as they are, and I hope will continue if we allow them to remain in their own mansions. In the memory of our fathers, Pyrrhus, by his ambassador Cineus, made trial of the dispositions not only of our men, but of our women also, by offers of presents. At that time, the Oppian law for restraining female luxury had not been made, and yet not one woman accepted a present. What, think you, was the reason? That for which our ancestors made no provision by law on this subject. There was no luxury existing which might be restrained. As diseases must necessarily be known before their remedies, so passions come into being before the laws which prescribe limits to them. What call forth the Licinian law, restricting estates to five hundred acres, but the unbounded desire for enlarging estates? What the Sinaian law, concerning gifts and presents, but that the plebeians had become vassals and tributaries to the Senate? It is not, therefore, in any degree surprising that no want of the Oppian law or of any other, to limit the expenses of the women, was felt at that time, when they refused to receive gold and purple that was thrown in their way, and offered to their acceptance. If Cineus were now to go round the city with his presence, he would find numbers of women standing in the public streets ready to receive them. There are some passions, the causes or motive of which I can no way account for. To be debarred of a liberty in which another is indulged may perhaps naturally excite some degree of shame or indignation. Yet, when the dress of all is alike, what inferiority in appearance can any one be ashamed of? Of all kinds of shame, the worst, surely, is the being ashamed of frugality or of poverty. But the law relieves you with regard to both. You want only that which is unlawful for you to have. This equalization, says the rich matron, is the very thing that I cannot endure. Why do not I make a figure, distinguished with gold and purple? Why is the poverty of others concealed under this cover of law, so that it should be thought that, if the law permitted, they would have such things as they are not now able to procure? Romans. Do you wish to excite among your wives an emulation of this sort, that the rich should wish to have what no other can have, and that the poor, lest they should be despised as such, should extend their expenses beyond their abilities? Be assured that when a woman once begins to be ashamed of what she ought not to be ashamed of, she will not be ashamed of what she ought. She who can will purchase out of her own purse. She who cannot 
will ask her husband. Unhappy is the husband, both he who complies with the request and he who does not. For what he will not give himself, another will. Now they openly solicit favors from other women's husbands, and, what is more, solicit a law and votes. From some they obtain them, although with regard to you, your property, or your children, you would find it hard to obtain anything from them. If the law ceases to limit the expenses of your wife, you yourself will never be able to limit them. Do not suppose that the matter will hereafter be in the same state in which it was before the law was made on the subject. It is safer that a wicked man should never be accused than that he should be acquitted. And luxury, if it had never been meddled with, would be more tolerable than it will be now like a wild beast, irritated by having been chained and then let loose. My opinion is that the Oppian law ought on no account to be repealed. Whatever determination you may come to, I pray all the gods to prosper it. End of section 3「Section 4 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. To His Mutinous Troops by Scipio Africanus Major. Born about 284 B.C., died in 183. Served at Cannae, and while proconsul conquered Spain. Twice defeated Asdrubal, and in 202 gained the Battle of Zama, after which he negotiated the treaty which ended the Second Punic War. Footnote. Delivered at Sucro in Spain in 203 B.C. Reported by Livy. Spillan and Edmund's translation. End footnote. 203 B.C. I imagined that language would never fail me in which to address my army. Not that I have ever accustomed myself to speaking rather than action, but because having been kept in a camp almost from my boyhood, I had become familiar with the dispositions of soldiers. But I am at a loss both for sentiments and expressions with which to address you, whom I know not even by what name I ought to call. Can I call you countrymen who have revolted from your country? or soldiers who have rejected the command and authority of your general, and violated the solemn obligation of your oath? Can I call you enemies? I recognize the persons, faces, dress, and mien of fellow countrymen, but I perceive the actions, expressions, intentions, and feelings of enemies. For what have you wished and hoped for, but what the Illergetians and Lacetanians did? Yet they followed Mandonius and Indibilis, men of royal rank who were the leaders of their mad project. You conferred the auspices and command upon the Umbrian, Atreus, and the Calenian, Albius. Deny soldiers that you were all concerned in this measure, or that you approved of it when taken. I shall willingly believe when you disclaim it that it was the folly and madness of a few. For the acts which have been committed are of such a nature that, if the whole army participated in them, they could not be expiated without atonements of tremendous magnitude. Upon these points, like wounds, I touch with reluctance. But unless touched and handled, they cannot be cured. For my own part, I believed that, after the Carthaginians were expelled from Spain, there was not a place in the whole province where, or any persons to whom, my life was obnoxious. Such was the manner in which I had conducted myself, not only toward my allies, but even toward my enemies. But lo, even in my own camp, so much was I deceived in my opinion, the report of my death was not only readily believed, but anxiously awaited for. Not that I wish to implicate you all in this enormity, for, be assured, if I supposed that the whole of my army desired my death, I would here immediately expire before your eyes, nor could I take any pleasure in a life which was odious to my countrymen and my soldiers. But every multitude is in its nature like the ocean, which though in itself incapable of motion is excited by storms and winds. 
so also in yourselves there is calm and there are storms but the cause and origin of your fury are entirely attributable to those who led you on you have caught your madness by contagion nay even this day you do not appear to me to be aware to what a pitch of frenzy you have proceeded what a heinous crime you have dared to commit against myself your country your parents your children against the gods the witnesses of your oath against the auspices under which you serve against the laws of war the discipline of your ancestors and the majesty of the highest authority with regard to myself i say nothing you may have believed the report of my death rather inconsiderately than eagerly lastly suppose me to be such a man that it could not at all be a matter of astonishment that my army should be weary of my command yet what had your country deserved of you which you betrayed by making common cause with mandonius and indibilis what the roman people when taking the command from the tribunes appointed by their suffrages you conferred it on private men when not content even with having them for tribunes you a roman army conferred the fasces of your general upon men who never had a slave under their command albius and atreus had their tents in your general's pavilion with them the trumpet sounded from them the word was taken they sat upon the tribunal of scipio upon whom the lictor attended for them the crowd was cleared away as they moved along before them the fasces with the axes were carried when showers of stones descend lightnings are darted from the heavens and animals give birth to monsters you consider these things as prodigies this is a prodigy which can be expiated by no victims by no supplications without the blood of those men who have dared to commit so great a crime now though villainy is never guided by reason yet so far as it could exist in so nefarious a transaction i would fain know what was your design formerly a legion which was sent to garrison regium wickedly put to the sword the principal inhabitants and kept possession of that opulent city through a space of ten years on account of which enormity the entire legion consisting of four thousand men were beheaded in the forum at rome but they in the first place did not put themselves under the direction of atreus the umbrian scarcely superior to a scullion whose name even was ominous but of decius jubelius a military tribune nor did they unite themselves with pyrrhus or with the samnites or lucanians the enemies of the roman people but you made common cause with bandonius and indibilis and intended also to have united your arms with them they intended to have held regium as a lasting settlement as the campanians held capua which they took from its ancient tuscan inhabitants and as the mamertines held Massana in sicily without any design of commencing without provocation a war upon the roman people or their allies was it your purpose to hold sucro as a place of abode here had i your general left you on my departure after the reduction of the province you would have been justified in imploring the interference of gods and men because you could not return to your wives and children but suppose that you banished from your minds all recollection of these as you did of your country and myself I would wish to track the course of a wicked design, but not of one utterly insane. While I was alive, and the rest of the army safe, with which in one day I took Carthage, with which I routed, put to flight, and expelled from Spain four generals and four armies of the Carthaginians, did you, I say, who were only eight thousand men, all of course of less worth than Albius and Atreus, to whom you subjected yourselves, hope to wrest the province of spain out of the hands of the roman people footnote this force had been placed on the ibenus now the ebro to guard the settlements on its eastern shore against the carthaginians in footnote i lay no stress upon my own name i put it out of the question let it be supposed that i have not been injured by you in any respect beyond the ready credence of my death what if i were dead was the state to expire with me was the empire of the roman people to fall with met jupiter most good and great would not have permitted that the existence of the city built under the auspices and sanction of the gods to last for ever should terminate with that of this frail and perishable body 
the roman people have survived those many and distinguished generals who were all cut off in one war flaminius paulus gracchus postumius albinus marcus marcellus titus quinctius crispinus gnaeus fulvius my kinsmen the scipios and will survive a thousand others who may perish some by the sword others by disease and would the roman state have been buried with my single corpse you yourselves here in spain when your two generals my father and my uncle fell chose septimus marcius as your general to oppose the carthaginians exulting on account of their recent victory and thus i speak on the supposition that spain would have been without a leader would marcus solanus who was sent into the province with the same power and the same command as myself would lucius scipio my brother and gaius laelius lieutenant generals have been wanting to avenge the majesty of the empire could the armies the generals themselves their dignity or their cause be compared with one another and even had you got the better of all these would you bear arms in conjunction with the carthaginians against your country against your countrymen would you wish that africa should rule italy and carthage the city of rome if so for what offence on the part of your country an unjust sentence of condemnation and a miserable and undeserved banishment formerly induced coriolanus to go and fight against his country he was restrained however by private duty from public parricide what grief what resentment instigated you was the delay of your pay for a few days during the illness of your general a reason of sufficient weight for you to declare war against your country to revolt from the roman people and join the Ilergetians? to leave no obligation divine or human unviolated without doubt soldiers you were mad nor was the disease which seized my frame more violent than that with which your minds were affected i shrink with horror from the relation of what men believed what they hoped and wished let oblivion cover all these things if possible if not however it be let them be covered in silence I must confess my speech must have appeared to you severe and harsh, but how much more harsh, think you, must your actions be than my words? Do you think it reasonable that I should suffer all the acts which you have committed, and that you should not bear with patience even to hear them mentioned? But you shall not be reproached even with these things any further. I could wish that you might as easily forget them as I shall therefore as far as relates to the general body of you if you repent of the error you have committed i shall have received sufficient and more than sufficient atonement for it albus the Calinian and atreus the umbrian with the rest of the principal movers of this impious mutiny shall expiate with their blood the crime they have perpetrated to yourselves if you have returned to a sound state of mind the sight of their punishment ought not only to be not unpleasant but even gratifying for there are no persons to whom the measures they have taken are more hostile and injurious than to you. End of section 4. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 5 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. Fragments by Tiberius Gracchus. Footnote. Of the speeches of the Gracchi only a few fragments have come down to us, and these mainly through Plutarch. Doubtless many fine passages existed in those lost books of Livy over which generations of scholars have shed lamentations. In footnote. Born about 168 B.C., died in 133 eldest son of cornelia the daughter of scipio africanus major accompanied scipio africanus minor to carthage quaestor in one thirty seven served in the numantine war tribune of the people in one thirty three secured the revival of the licinian agrarian law of three sixty seven b c in one thirty three killed with many of his followers in an electoral disturbance in rome footnote Plutarch says this speech by Tiberius Gracchus filled the people with enthusiastic fury, and none of his adversaries durst pretend to answer him. 
Smith, in his dictionary, refers to it as a noble specimen of the deeply felt and impressive eloquence with which Gracchus addressed the people in those days. In footnote. About 133 B.C. The wild beasts of Italy have their caves to retire to, but the brave men who spill their blood in her cause have nothing left but air and light. Without houses, without settled habitations, they wander from place to place with their wives and children, and their generals do but mock them when, at the head of their armies, they exhort their men to fight for their sepulchres and the gods of their hearths. For among such numbers, perhaps, there is not one Roman who has an altar that has belonged to his ancestors, or a sepulchre in which their ashes rest. The private soldiers fight and die to advance the wealth and luxury of the great, and they are called masters of the world without having a sod to call their own. Is it not just that what belongs to the people should be shared by the people? Is a man with no capacity for fighting more useful to his country than a soldier? Is a citizen inferior to a slave? Is an alien, or one who owns some of his country's soil, the best patriot? You have won by war most of your possessions, and hope to acquire the rest of the habitable globe. But now it is but a hazard whether you gain the rest by bravery, or whether by your weakness and discord you were robbed of what you have by your foes. Wherefore, in prospect of such acquisitions, you should, if need be, spontaneously, and of your own free will, yield up these lands to those who will rear children for the service of the state. Do not sacrifice a great thing while striving for a small, especially as you are to receive no contemptible compensation for your expenditure on the land in free ownership of five hundred Ugira, secure forever, and in case you have sons of two hundred and fifty more for each of them. Footnote. Tiberius, having deposed one of his colleagues, a tribune, caused offense in that he had robbed that high office of its dignity. He then, says Plutarch, called the commons together again and made a speech, from which Plutarch makes this extract, by way of specimen of the power and strength of his eloquence. The Langhorn Translation. In footnote. The person of a tribune, I acknowledge, is sacred and inviolable, because he is consecrated to the people and takes their interest under his protection. But when he deserts those interests, and becomes an oppressor of the people, when he retrenches their privileges and takes away their liberty of voting, by those acts he deprives himself, for he no longer keeps to the intention of his employment. Otherwise, if a tribune should demolish the capital and burn the docks and naval stores, his person could not be touched. A man who should do such things as those might still be a tribune, though a vile one, but he who diminishes the privileges of the people ceases to be a tribune of the people. Does it not shock you to think that a tribune should be able to imprison a consul, and the people not have it in their power to deprive a tribune of his authority when he uses it against those who gave it? For the tribunes, as well as the consuls, are elected by the people. Kingly government seems to comprehend all authority in itself, and kings are consecrated with the most awful ceremonies. Yet the citizens expelled Tarquin when his administration became iniquitous, and for the offense of one man the ancient government under whose auspices Rome was erected was entirely abolished. What is there in Rome so sacred and venerable as the Vestal Virgins who keep the perpetual fire? Yet if any of them transgress the rules of her order, she is buried alive. For they who are guilty of impiety against the gods lose that sacred character which they had only for the sake of the gods. So a tribune who injures the people can be no longer sacred or inviolable on the people's account. He destroys that power in which alone his strength lay. If it is just for him to be invested with the tribunal authority by a majority of tribes, is it not more just for him to be deposed by the suffrages of them all? What is more sacred and inviolable than the offerings in the temples of the gods? Yet no one pretends to hinder the people from making use of them, or removing them whenever they please. And indeed that the tribune's office is not inviolable or unremovable appears from hence that several have voluntarily laid it down, or been discharged at their own request. End of section 5. Recording by Philip Gould.
Section six of the world's famous orations, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The world's famous orations, volume two. Fragments by Gaius Gracchus. Footnote. Gaius Gracchus was the greatest orator of his time in Rome. Dion Cassius, the historian who lived three hundred years later than Gaius, has preserved for us the tradition that was still extant in his time. He says that Gaius far surpassed Tiberius in his gift of language, and was the first to walk up and down in the assemblies which he harangued, and the first to bear his arms. Hence neither of these practices has been thought improper since he employed them. Plutarch confirms his testimony. When he entered upon his office, he soon became the leading tribune, partly by means of his eloquence, in which he was greatly superior to the rest, and partly on account of the misfortunes of his family, which gave him opportunity to bewail the cruel fate of his brothers. Cicero, born sixteen years after the death of Gaius, said he was the first man who, in an old literature, appeared with a new language. In footnote. Born about 161 B.C., served in Spain with Scipio Africanus Minor, quaestor in Sardinia in 126 to 123, elected tribune of the people in 123 when he secured a renewal of the agrarian law passed in the time of his brother, built and improved roads, and sought to establish democratic government in Rome, re-elected tribune in 122, failed of re-election in 121, killed in a disturbance in Rome, 121 about 122 B.C. My life in the province was not planned to suit my ambition, but your interests. There was no gormandizing with me, no handsome slaves in waitings, and at my table your sons saw more seemliness than at headquarters. No man can say without lying that I ever took a farthing as a present, or put any one to expense. I was there two years, and if a single courtesan ever crossed my doors, or if proposals from me were ever made to any one slave pet, set me down for the vilest and most infamous of men. And if I was so scrupulous towards slaves, you may judge what my life must have been with your sons. And, citizens, here is the fruit of such a life. I left Rome with a full purse, and have brought it back empty. Others took out their wine jars full of wine, and brought them back full of money. Your forefathers declared war against Felici, in order to revenge the cause of Genusius, one of their tribunes, to whom the people had given scurrilous language. And they thought capital punishment little enough for Gaius Veturius, because he alone did not break way for a tribune who was passing through the forum. But you suffered Tiberius to be dispatched with bludgeons before your eyes, and his dead body to be dragged from the capital through the middle of the city in order to be thrown into the river. Such of his friends, too, as fell into their hands were put to death without form of trial. Yet by the custom of our country, if any person under a prosecution for a capital crime did not appear, an officer was sent to his door in the morning to summon him by sound of trumpet and the judges would never pass sentence before so public a citation. So tender were our ancestors in any matter where the life of a citizen were concerned. Footnote. The Langhorn Translation. End footnote. End of section 6. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 7 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. On a Corrupt Oligarchy. By Gaius Mimius. Gaius Mimius. On a Corrupt Oligarchy. Footnote. Delivered to an assembly of the people in Rome. Reported by Sallust. Translated by John S. Watson. End footnote. About 110 B.C. Born in unknown B.C., died in 100, tribune of the plebs in 111, 
vigorously opposed the oligarchical party during the war with Jugurtha, and by exposing corruption, opened the way to command of the army by Marius, while a candidate for consul in one hundred, slain by a mob armed with bludgeons. Were not my zeal for the good of the state, my fellow citizens, superior to every other feeling, there are many considerations which would deter me from appearing in your cause. I allude to the power of the opposite party, your own tameness of spirit, the absence of all justice, and, above all, the fact that integrity is attended with more danger than honor. Indeed, it grieves me to relate how, during the last fifteen years, you have been a sport to the arrogance of an oligarchy. How dishonorably and how utterly unavenged your defenders have perished, and how your spirit has become degenerate by sloth and indolence. For not even now, when your enemies are in your power, will you rouse yourselves to action, but continue still to stand in awe of those to whom you should be a terror. Yet notwithstanding this state of things, I feel prompted to make an attack on the power of that faction. That liberty of speech, therefore, which has been left me by my father, I shall assuredly exert against them. But whether I shall use it in vain, or for your advantage, must, my fellow citizens, depend upon yourselves. I do not, however, exhort you, as your ancestors have often done, to rise in arms against injustice. There is at present no need of violence, no need of secession for your tyrants must work their fall by their own misconduct. After the murder of Tiberius Gracchus, whom they accused of aspiring to be king, persecutions were instituted against the common people of Rome, and after the slaughter of Gaius Gracchus and Marcus Fulvius, many of your order were put to death in prison. But let us leave these proceedings out of the question. Let us admit that to restore their rights to the people was to aspire to sovereignty. Let us allow that what cannot be avenged without shedding the blood of citizens was done with justice. You have seen with silent indignation, however, in past years, the treasury pillaged. You have seen kings and free people paying tribute to a small party of patricians in whose hands were both the highest honors and the greatest wealth. But to have carried on such proceedings with impunity, they now deem but a small matter and at last your laws and your honor, with every civil and religious obligation, have been sacrificed for the benefit of your enemies. Nor do they, who have done these things, show either shame or contrition, but parade proudly before your faces, displaying their sacerdotal dignities, their consulships, and some of them their triumphs, as if they regard them as marks of honor and not as fruits of their dishonesty. Slaves purchased with money will not submit to unjust commands from their masters, yet you, my fellow citizens, who are born to empire, tamely endure oppression. But who are these that have thus taken the government into their hands? Men of the most abandoned character, of blood-stained hands, of insatiable avarice, of enormous guilt, and of matchless pride. Men by whom integrity, reputation, public spirit, and indeed everything, whether honorable or dishonorable, is converted to a means of gain. Some of them make it their defense that they have killed tribunes of the people, others that they have instituted unjust prosecutions, others that they have shed your blood, and thus, the more atrocities each has committed, the greater is his security, while your oppressors, whom the same desires, the same aversions, and the same fears combine in strict union, a union which among good men is friendship, but among the bad confederacy and guilt, have excited in you, through your want of spirit, that terror which they ought to feel for their own crimes. But if your concern to preserve your liberty were as great as their ardor to increase their power of oppression, the state would not be distracted as it is at present, and the marks of favor which proceed from you would be conferred not on the most shameless, but on the most deserving. Your forefathers, in order to assert their rights and establish their authority, twice seceded in arms to Mount Aventine, and will not you exert yourselves to the utmost of your power in defense of that liberty which you received from them? Will you not display so much the more spirit in the cause, from the reflection, 
that it is a greater disgrace to lose what has been gained than not to have gained it at all? But some will ask me, what course of conduct, then, would you advise us to pursue? I would advise you to inflict punishment on those who have sacrificed the interest of their country to the enemy, not, indeed, by arms or any violence, which would be more unbecoming, however, for you to inflict than for them to suffer, but by prosecutions, and by the evidence of Jugurtha himself, who, if he has really surrendered, will doubtless obey your summons, whereas, if he shows contempt for it, you will at once judge what sort of peace or surrender it is, from which springs impunity to Jugurtha for his crimes, immense wealth to a few men in power, and loss and infamy to the Republic. But perhaps you are not yet weary of the tyranny of these men. Perhaps these times please you less than those when kingdoms, provinces, and peace, and indeed everything civil and religious was in the hands of an oligarchy, while you, that is, the people of Rome, though unconquered by foreign enemies and rulers of all nations around, were content with being allowed to live. For which of you had the spirit to throw off your slavery? For myself, indeed, though I think it most disgraceful to receive an injury without resenting it, yet I could easily allow you to pardon these basest of traitors, because they are your fellow citizens, were it not certain that your indulgence would end in your destruction. For such is their presumption, that to escape punishment for their misdeeds will have but little effect upon them, unless they be deprived, at the same time, of the power of doing mischief. And endless anxiety will remain for you, if you shall have to reflect that you must either be slaves, or preserve your liberty by force of arms. Of mutual trust or concord, what hope is there? They wish to be lords. You desire to be free. They seek to inflict injury, you to repel it. They treat your allies as enemies, your enemies as allies. With feelings so opposite, can peace or friendship subsist between you? I warn, therefore, and exhort you not to allow such enormous dishonesty to go unpunished. It is not an embezzlement of the public money that has been committed, nor is it a forcible extortion of money from your allies, offenses which, though great, are now from their frequency considered as nothing. But the authority of the Senate, and your own power, have been sacrificed to the bitterest of enemies, and the public interest has been betrayed for money, both at home and abroad. And unless these misdeeds be investigated, and punishment be inflicted on the guilty, what remains for us but to live the slaves of those who committed them? For those who do what they will with impunity are undoubtedly kings. I do not, however, wish to encourage you, Romans, to be better satisfied at finding your fellow citizens guilty than innocent, but merely to warn you not to bring ruin on the good by suffering the bad to escape. It is far better in any government to be unmindful of a service than of an injury, for a good man, if neglected, only becomes less active but a bad man more daring. Besides, if the crimes of the wicked are suppressed, the state will seldom need extraordinary support from the virtuous. End of section 7. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 8 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. On Being Accused of a Low Origin, by Gaius Marius. Gaius Marius on Being Accused of a Low Origin. Born about 156 B.C., died in 86. Served in Africa under the younger Scipio. Married Julia, the aunt of Julius Caesar. Elected consul of the plebs in 107, successfully conducted war against Jugurtha in 106, the Teutons in 103-102, and the Cimbri in 101. Made consul for the sixth time in 100, suppressed civil war under Sulla in 88-87, consul again in 86. Footnote. Delivered in 106 B.C. before an assembly of the people in Rome, called by himself, as well as to encourage them to enlist, says Sallust, as to inveigh according to his practice against the nobility. 
Reported by Sallust. Translated by John S. Watson. End footnote. 106 B.C. I am sensible, my fellow citizens, that the eyes of all men are turned upon me, that the just and good favor me as my services are beneficial to the state, but that the nobility seek occasion to attack me. I must therefore use the greater exertion that you may not be deceived in me, and that their views may be rendered abortive. I have led such a life, indeed from my boyhood to the present hour, that I am familiar with every kind of toil and danger, and that exertion which, before your kindness to me, I practice gratuitously, it is not my intention to relax after having received my reward. For those who have pretended to be men of worth only to secure their election, it may be difficult to conduct themselves properly in office. But to me, who has passed my whole life in the most honorable occupations, to act well has from habit become nature. You have commanded me to carry on the war against Jugurtha, a commission at which the nobility are highly offended. Footnote. War against Jugurtha, king of Numidia, had been declared six years before in 112 B.C., but owing to bribes from Jugurtha, no Roman general had fought him successfully until 109, when Metellus forced him to seek protection from another African king. Marius now succeeded Metellus, under whom, in a previous campaign, he had served. End footnote. Consider with yourselves, I pray you, whether it would be a change for the better if you were to send to this, or to any other such appointment, one of yonder crowd of nobles, a man of ancient family, of innumerable statues, and of no military experience, in order forsooth that in so important an office, and being ignorant of everything connected with it, he may exhibit hurry, and trepidation, and select one of the people to instruct him in his duty. For so it generally happens, that he whom you have chosen to direct, seeks another to direct him. I know some, my fellow citizens, who, after they have been elected consuls, have begun to read the acts of their ancestors, and the military precepts of the Greeks. Persons who invert the order of things, for though to discharge the duties of the office is posterior, in point of time, to election, it is in reality and practical importance prior to it. Compare now, my fellow citizens, me, who am a new man, with those haughty nobles. What they have but heard or read, I have witnessed or performed. What they have learned from books, I have acquired in the field. And whether deeds or words are of greater estimation, it is for you to consider. They despise my humbleness of birth. I condemn their imbecility. My condition is made an objection to me. Their misconduct is a reproach to them. The circumstance of birth, indeed, I consider, is one and the same to all, but think that he who best exerts himself is the noblest. And could it be inquired of the fathers of Albinus and Bestia whether they would rather be the parents of them or of me? What do you suppose that they would answer, but that they would wish the most deserving to be their offspring? If the patricians justly despise me, let them also despise their own ancestors, whose nobility, like mine, had its origin and merit. They envy me the honor that I have received. Let them also envy me the toils, the abstinence, and the perils by which I obtained that honor. But they, men eaten up with pride, live as if they disdained all the distinctions that you can bestow and yet sue for those distinctions as if they had lived so as to merit them. Yet those are assuredly deceived who expect to enjoy, at the same time, things so incompatible as the pleasures of indolence and the rewards of honorable exertion. When they speak before you, or in the Senate, they occupy the greatest part of their orations in extolling their ancestors, for they suppose that, by recounting the heroic deeds of their forefathers, they render themselves more illustrious. But the reverse of this is the case, for the more glorious were the lives of their ancestors, the more scandalous is their own inaction. The truth indeed is plainly this, that the glory of ancestors sheds a light on their posterity which suffers neither their virtues nor their vices to be concealed. Of this light, my fellow citizens, I have no share, but I have what confers much more distinction the power of relating my own actions. 
Consider, then, how unreasonable they are. What they claim to themselves for the merit of others, they will not grant me for my own, alleging, forsooth, that I have no statues, and that my distinction is newly acquired. But it is surely better to have acquired such distinction myself than to bring disgrace on that received from others. I am not ignorant that, if they were inclined to reply to me, they would make an abundant display of eloquent and artful language. Yet since they attack both you and myself, on occasion of the great favor which you have conferred upon me, I did not think proper to be silent before them, lest any one should construe my forbearance into a consciousness of demerit. As for myself, indeed, nothing that is said of me, I feel assured, can do me injury. For what is true must of necessity speak in my favor. What is false my life and character will refute. But since your judgment in bestowing on me so distinguished an honor, and so important a trust, is called in question, consider, I beseech you, again and again, whether you are likely to repent of what you have done. I cannot, to raise your confidence in me, boast of the statues, or triumphs, or consulships of my ancestors. But if it be thought necessary, I can show you spears, a banner, caparisons for horses, and other military rewards besides the scars of wounds on my breast. These are my statues. This is my nobility. Honors not left like theirs by inheritance, but acquired amid innumerable toils and dangers. My speech, they say, is inelegant but that I have ever thought of little importance. Worth sufficiently displays itself. It is for my detractors to use studied language that they may palliate base conduct by plausible words. Nor have I learned Greek, for I had no wish to acquire a tongue that adds nothing to the valor of those who teach it. But I have gained other accomplishments, such as are of the utmost benefit to a state. I have learned to strike down an enemy, to be vigilant at my post, to fear nothing but dishonor, to bear cold and heat with equal endurance, to sleep on the ground, and to sustain at the same time hunger and fatigue. And with such rules of conduct I shall stimulate my soldiers, not treating them with rigor and myself with indulgence, nor making their toils my glory. Such a mode of commanding is at once useful to the state and becoming to a citizen. For to coerce your troops with severity, while you yourself live at ease, is to be a tyrant, not a general. It was by conduct such as this, my fellow citizens, that your ancestors made themselves and the Republic renowned. Our nobility, relying on their forefathers' merits, though totally different from them in conduct, disparage us who emulate their virtues, and demand of you every public honor, as due not to their personal merit, but to their high rank. Arrogant pretenders and utterly unreasonable. For though their ancestors left them all that was at their disposal, their riches, their statues, and their glorious names, they left them not, nor could leave them, their virtue, which alone of all their possessions could neither be communicated nor received. They reproach me as being mean and of unpolished manners, because, forsooth, I have but little skill in arranging an entertainment, and keep no actor, nor give my cook higher wages than my steward. All which charges I must indeed acknowledge to be just. For I learned from my father and other venerable characters that vain indulgences belong to women, and labor to men, that glory rather than wealth should be the object of the virtuous and that arms and armor, not household furniture, are marks of honor. But let the nobility, if they please, pursue what is delightful and dear to them. Let them devote themselves to licentiousness and luxury. Let them pass their age as they have passed their youth, in revelry and feasting, the slaves of gluttony and debauchery. But let them leave the toil and dust of the field and other such matters to us, to whom they are more grateful than banquets. This, however, they will not do. For when these most infamous of men have disgraced themselves by every species of turpitude, they proceed to claim the distinctions due to the most honorable. Thus it most unjustly happens that luxury and indolence, the most disgraceful of vices, 
are harmless to those who indulge in them, and fatal only to the innocent commonwealth. As I have now replied to my calumniators as far as my own character required, though not so fully as their flagitiousness deserved, I shall add a few more words on the state of public affairs. In the first place, my fellow citizens, be of good courage with regard to Numidia, for all that hitherto protected Jugurtha, avarice, inexperience, and arrogance, you have entirely removed. There is an army in it, too, which is well acquainted with the country, though assuredly more brave than fortunate, for a great part of it has been destroyed by the avarice or rashness of its commanders. Such of you, then, as are of military age, cooperate with me, and support the cause of your country, and let no discouragement from the ill fortune of others, or the arrogance of the late commanders, affect any one of you. I myself shall be with you, both on the march and in the battle, both to direct your movements and to share your dangers. I shall treat you and myself on every occasion alike, and, doubtless, with the aid of the gods, all good things, victory, spoil, and glory, are ready to our hands, though even if they were doubtful or distant, it would still become every able citizen to act in defense of his country. For no man by slothful timidity has escaped the lot of mortals, nor has any parent wished for his children that they might live forever, but rather that they might act in life with virtue and honor. I would add more, my fellow citizens, if words could give courage to the faint-hearted. To the brave, I think that I have said enough. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 9 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. The First Oration Against Verus by Cicero. Cicero, The First Oration Against Verus. Footnote. Delivered in Rome in 70 B.C. Translated by Charles Duke Yonge. Abridged. The only one of Cicero's six orations against Verus that was actually delivered. Verus, as governor of Sicily, had plundered that island of its art treasures and other property. End footnote. Born in 106 B.C., died in 43. Served in the Social War in 89. Quaestor in Sicily in 75. Edile in 69, Praetor in 66, Consul during the Catiline Conspiracy, Banished in 58, Proconsul of Cilicia 51 to 50, with the Pompeians in 49, Proscribed by the Second Triumvirate and slain in 43. Of his orations, 57 have been preserved. 70 B.C. That which was above all things to be desired, O judges, and which above all things was calculated to have the greatest influence toward allaying the unpopularity of your order, and putting an end to the discredit into which your judicial decisions have fallen, appears to have been thrown in your way, and given to you not by any human contrivance, but almost by the interposition of the gods, at a most important crisis of the Republic. For an opinion has now become established, pernicious to us and pernicious to the Republic, which has been the common talk of every one, not only at Rome, but among foreign nations also, that in the courts of law as they exist at present, no wealthy man, however guilty he may be, can possibly be convicted. Now at this time of peril to your order and to your tribunal, when men are ready to attempt by harangues and by the proposal of new laws to increase the existing unpopularity of the Senate, Gaius Varius is brought to trial as a criminal, a man condemned in the opinion of every one by his life and actions, but acquitted by the enormousness of his wealth according to his own hope and boast. I, judges, have undertaken this cause as prosecutor with the greatest good wishes and expectation on the part of the Roman people not in order to increase the unpopularity of the Senate, but to relieve it from the discredit which I share with it. 
for I have brought before you a man, by acting justly in whose case you have an opportunity of retrieving the lost credit of your judicial proceedings, of regaining your credit with the Roman people, and of giving satisfaction to foreign nations. A man, the embezzler of the public funds, the petty tyrant of Asia and Pamphylia, the robber who deprived the city of its rights, the disgrace and ruin of the province of Sicily. And if you come to a decision about this man with severity and a due regard to your oaths, that authority which ought to remain in you will cling to you still. But if that man's vast riches shall break down the sanctity and honesty of the courts of justice, at least I shall achieve this, that it shall be plain that it was rather honest judgment that was wanting to the Republic than a criminal to the judges, or an accuser to the criminal. I indeed that I may confess to you the truth about myself, judges, though many snares were laid for me by Gaius Verus, both by land and sea, which I partly avoided by my own vigilance, and partly warded off by the zeal and kindness of my friends, yet I never seemed to be incurring so much danger, and I never was in such a state of great apprehension, as I am now in this very court of law. Nor does the expectation which people have formed of my conduct of this prosecution, nor this concourse of so vast a multitude as is here assembled, influence me, though indeed I am greatly agitated by these circumstances, so much as his nefarious plots which he is endeavouring to lay at one and the same time against me, against you, against Marcus Glabrio the praetor, and against the allies, against foreign nations, against the Senate, and even against the very name of Senator, whose favourite saying it is, that they have got to fear who have stolen only as much as is enough for themselves, but that he has stolen so much that it may easily be plenty for many, that nothing is so holy that it cannot be corrupted, or so strongly fortified that it cannot be stormed by money. But if he were as secret in acting as he is audacious in attempting, perhaps in some particular he might some time or other have escaped our notice. But it happens very fortunately that to his incredible audacity is joined a most unexampled folly. For as he was unconcealed in committing his robberies of money, so in his hope of corrupting the judges has he made his intentions and endeavours visible to every one. He says that only once in his life has he felt fear, at a time when he was first impeached as a criminal by me, because he was only lately arrived from his province, and was branded with unpopularity and infamy, not modern, but ancient and of long standing. And besides that, the time was unlucky, being very ill-suited for corrupting the judges. Therefore, when I had demanded a very short time to prosecute my inquiries in Sicily, he found a man to ask for two days less to make investigations in Achaia, not with any real intention of doing the same with his diligence and industry that I have accomplished by my labor and daily and nightly investigations. For the Achaean Inquisitor never even arrived at Brundusium. I in fifty days so traveled over the whole of Sicily that I examined into the records and injuries of all the tribes and of all private individuals, so that it was easily visible to every one that he had been seeking out a man not really for the purpose of bringing the defendant whom he accused to trial, but merely to occupy the time which ought to belong to me. Now that most audacious and most senseless man thinks this. He is aware that I am come into court so thoroughly prepared and armed that I shall fix all his thefts and crimes not only in your ears, but in the very eyes of all men. He sees that many senators are witnesses of his audacity. He sees that many Roman knights are so too, and many citizens, and many of the allies besides, to whom he has done unmistakable injuries. He sees also that very numerous and very important deputations have come here at the same time from most friendly cities, armed with the public authority and evidence collected by their states. In truth, what genius is there so powerful? what faculty of speaking, what eloquence so mighty, as to be in any particular able to defend the life of that man, convicted as it is of so many vices and crimes, and long since condemned by the inclinations and private sentiments of every one, and to say nothing of the stains and disgraces of his youth, 
what other remarkable event is there in his questorship that first step to honor except that Gnaeus Carbo was robbed by his quester of the public money, that the consul was plundered and betrayed, his army deserted, his province abandoned, the holy nature and obligations imposed on him by lot violated, whose lieutenancy was the ruin of all Asia and Pamphylia, in which provinces he plundered many houses, very many cities, all the shrines and temples, when he renewed and repeated against Gnaeus Dolabella his ancient wicked tricks when he had been quester, and did not only in his danger desert, but even attack and betray the man to whom he had been lieutenant, and proquester, and whom he had brought into odium by his crimes, whose city praetorship was the destruction of the sacred temples and the public works, and as to his legal decisions, was the adjudging and awarding of property contrary to all established rules and precedents. But now he has established great and numerous monuments and proofs of all his vices in the province of Sicily, which he for three years so harassed and ruined, that it can by no possibility be restored to its former condition, and appears scarcely able to be at all recovered after a long series of years and a long succession of virtuous praetors. While this man was praetor, the Sicilians enjoyed neither their own laws, nor the decrees of our Senate, nor the common rights of every nation. Every one in Sicily has only so much left as either escaped the notice, or was disregarded by the satiety of that most avaricious and licentious man. No legal decision for three years was given on any other ground but his will. No property was so secure to any man, even if it had descended to him from his father and grandfather, but he was deprived of it at his command. Enormous sums of money were extracted from the property of the cultivators of the soil by a new and nefarious system. The most faithful of the allies were classed in the number of enemies. Roman citizens were tortured and put to death like slaves. The greatest criminals were acquitted in the courts of justice through bribery. The most upright and honorable men, being prosecuted while absent, were condemned and banished without being heard in their own defense. The most fortified harbors, the greatest and strongest cities were laid open to pirates and robbers. The sailors and soldiers of the Sicilians, our own allies and friends, died of hunger. The best-built fleets on the most important stations were lost and destroyed, to the great disgrace of the Roman people. This same Manuel Prater plundered and stripped those most ancient monuments, some erected by wealthy monarchs and intended by them as ornaments for their cities, some too the work of our own generals, which they either gave or restored as conquerors to the different states in Sicily. And he did this not only in the case of public statues and ornaments, but he also plundered all the temples consecrated in the deepest religious feelings of the people. He did not leave, in short, one god to the Sicilians, which appeared to him to be made in a tolerable workmanlike manner, and with any of the skill of the ancients. I am prevented by actual shame from speaking of his nefarious licentiousness as shown in rapes and other such enormities, and I am unwilling also to increase the distress of those men who have been unable to preserve their children and their wives unpolluted by his wanton lust. But, you will say, these things were done by him in such a manner as not to be notorious to all men. I think there is no man who has heard his name who cannot also relate wicked actions of his, so that I ought rather to be afraid of being thought to omit many of his crimes than to invent any charges against him. And indeed I do not think that this multitude which has collected to listen to me wishes so much to learn of me what the facts of the case are as to go over it with me refreshing its recollection of what it knows already. And as this is the case, that senseless and profligate man attempts to combat me in another manner. He does not seek to oppose the eloquence of any one else to me. He does not rely on the popularity, or influence, or authority of any one. He pretends that he trusts to these things. But I see what he is really aiming at, and indeed he is not acting with any concealment. He sets before me empty titles of nobility, that is to say, the names of arrogant men who do not hinder me so much by being noble as assist me by being notorious. 
He pretends to rely on their protection, when he has in reality been contriving something else this long time. What hope he now has, and what he is endeavouring to do, I will now briefly explain to you, O judges. But first of all remark, I beg you, how the matter has been arranged by him from the beginning. When he first returned from the province, he endeavoured to get rid of this prosecution by corrupting the judges at a great expense. And this object he continued to keep in view till the conclusion of the appointment of the judges. After the judges were appointed, because in drawing lots for them the fortune of the Roman people had defeated his hopes, and in the rejecting some my diligence had defeated his impudence, the whole attempt at bribery was abandoned. The affair was going on admirably. List of your names and of the whole tribunal were in every one's hands. It did not seem possible to mark the votes of these men with any distinguishing mark or color or spot of dirt. And that fellow, from having been brisk and in high spirits, became on a sudden so downcast and humbled that he seemed to be condemned not only by the Roman people, but even by himself. But lo, all of a sudden, within these few days since the consular comitia have taken place, he has gone back to his original plan with more money, and the same plots are now laid against your reputation, and against the fortunes of every one, by the instrumentality of the same people. Which fact at first, O judges, was pointed out by me by a very slight hint and indication. But afterward, when my suspicions were once aroused, I arrived at the knowledge of all the most secret counsels of that party without any mistake. For has Hortensius, the consul-elect, was being attended home again from the campus, by a great concourse and multitude of people, Gaius Curio fell in with that multitude by chance, a man whom I wish to name by way of honor rather than disparagement. I will tell you what, if he had been unwilling to have it mentioned, he would not have spoken of in so large an assembly, so openly and undisguisedly, which, however, shall be mentioned by me deliberately and cautiously, that it may be seen that I pay due regard to our friendship and to his dignity. He sees Varus in the crowd by the arch of Fabius. He speaks to the man and with a loud voice congratulates him on his victory. Footnote. This arch, as explained in a note to Mr. Young's translation, had been erected to commemorate the victory obtained by Fabius over the Allobroges, and it was erected in the Via Sacra, as Cicero mentions in his speech, Proplancio. In footnote. He does not say a word to Hortensius himself, who had been made consul, or to his friends and relations who were present attending on him. But he stops to speak to this man embraces him, and bids him cast off all anxiety. I give you notice, said he, that you have been acquitted by this day's comitia. And as many most honorable men heard this, it is immediately reported to me the first thing. To some it appeared scandalous, to others again, ridiculous, ridiculous to those who thought that this cause depended on the credibility of the witnesses, on the importance of the charges, and on the power of the judges, and not on the consular comitia. Scandalous to those who looked deeper, and who thought that this congratulation had reference to the corruption of the judge. In truth they argued in this manner. The most honorable men spoke to one another and to me in this manner. That there were now manifestly and undeniably no courts of justice at all. The very criminal who the day before thought that he was already condemned, is acquitted now that his defender has been made consul. What are we to think, then? Will it avail nothing that all Sicily, all the Sicilians, that all the merchants who have business in that country, that all public and private documents are now at Rome? Nothing if the consul-elect wills it otherwise. What? Will not the judges be influenced by the accusation, by the evidence, by the universal opinion of the Roman people? No. Everything will be governed by the power and authority of one man. In the meantime my comitia began to be held, of which that fellow thought himself the master, as he had been of all the other comitia this year. He began to run about, that influential man, with his son, a youth of engaging and popular manners among the tribes. The son began to address and to call on all the friends of his father, that is to say, 
all his agents, for bribery. And when this was noticed and perceived, the Roman people took care with the most earnest good will that I should not be deprived of my honor through the money of that man, whose riches had not been able to make me violate my good faith. After that I was released from the great anxiety about my canvas. I began with a mind much more unoccupied and much more at ease to think of nothing and to do nothing except what related to this trial. I find, O oh judges, these plans formed and begun to be put in execution by them to protract the matter, whatever steps it might be necessary to take in order to do so, so that the cause might be pleaded before Marcus Metellus as praetor, that by doing so they would have these advantages. Firstly, that Marcus Metellus was most friendly to them. Secondly, that not only would Hortensius be consul, but Quintus Metellus also. And listen while I show you how great a friend he is to them. For he gave him a token of his good will of such a sort, that he seemed to be giving it as a return for the suffrages of the tribes which he had secured to him. Did you think that I would say nothing of such serious matters as these? and that, at a crisis of such danger to the Republic and my own character, I would consult anything rather than my duty and my dignity? The other consul-elect sent for the Sicilians. Some came because Lucius Metellus was praetor in Sicily. To them he speaks in this manner, that he is the consul, that one of his brothers has Sicily for a province, that the other is to be judge in all prosecutions for extortion, and that care had been taken in many ways that there should be no possibility of Varus being injured. I ask you, Metellus, what is corrupting the course of justice if this is not? To seek to frighten witnesses, and especially Sicilians, timid and oppressed men, not only by your own private influence, but by their fear of the consul, and by the power of two praetors. What could you do for an innocent man or for a relation, when for the sake of a most guilty man entirely unconnected with you, you depart from your duty and your dignity, and allow what he is constantly saying to appear true to any one who is not acquainted with you. For they said that Varus said, that you had not been made consul by destiny as the rest of your family had been, but by his assistance. Two consuls, therefore, and the judge are to be such because of his will. We shall not only, says he, avoid having a man too scrupulous and investigating, too subservient to the opinion of the people, Marcus Glabrio, but we shall have this advantage also. Marcus Caesonius is the judge, the colleague of your accuser, a man of tried and proved experience in the decision of actions. It will never do for us to have such a man as that on the bench, which we are endeavoring to corrupt by some means or other. For before, when he was one of the judges on the tribunal of which Junius was president, he was not only very indignant at that shameful transaction, but he even betrayed and denounced it. But as for what I had begun to say, namely that the contest is between you and me, this is it. I, when I had undertaken this cause at the request of the Sicilians, and had thought it a very honorable and glorious thing for me that they were willing to make experiment of my integrity and diligence, who already knew by experience my innocence and temperance. Then when I had undertaken this business, I proposed to myself some greater action, also by which the Roman people should be able to see my good will toward the Republic. For that seemed to me to be by no means worthy of my industry and efforts, for that man to be brought to trial by me, who had already been condemned by the judgment of all men unless that intolerable influence of yours, and that grasping nature which you have displayed for some years in many trials, were interposed also in the case of that desperate man. But now, since all this dominion and sovereignty of yours over the courts of justice delights you so much, and since there are some men who are neither ashamed of their licentiousness and their infamy, nor weary of it, and who, as if on purpose, seem to wish to encounter hatred and unpopularity from the Roman people, I profess that I have undertaken this, a great burden perhaps, and one dangerous to myself, but still worthy of my applying myself to it with all the vigor of my age and all diligence. And since the whole order of the Senate is weighed down by the discredit brought on it by the wickedness and audacity of a few, and is overwhelmed by the infamy of the tribunals, 
I profess myself an enemy to this race of men, an accuser worthy of their hatred, a persevering, a bitter adversary. I arrogate this to myself, I claim this for myself, and I will carry out this enmity in my magistracy, and from that post in which the Roman people has willed that from the next first of January I shall act in concert with it in matters concerning the Republic and concerning wicked men. I promise the Roman people that this shall be the most honorable and the fairest employment of my edileship. I warn, I forewarn, I give notice beforehand to those men who are wont either to put money down, to undertake for others to receive money, or to promise money, or to act as agents in bribery, or as go-betweens in corrupting the seat of judgment, and who have promised their influence, or their impudence in aid of such a business in this trial, to keep their hands and inclinations from this nefarious wickedness. And what do you suppose will be my thoughts if I find in this very trial any violation of the laws committed in any similar manner? especially when I can prove by many witnesses that Gaius Verus often said in Sicily in the hearing of many persons that he had a powerful friend, in confidence with whom he was plundering the province, and that he was not seeking money for himself alone, but that he had so distributed the three years of his Sicilian praetorship that he should say he did exceedingly well if he appropriated the gains of one year to the augmentation of his own property, those of the second year to his patrons and defenders, and reserved the whole of the third year, the most productive and gainful of all, for the judges. From which it came into my mind to say that which, when I had said lately before Marcus Glabrio at the time of striking the list of judges, I perceived the Roman people greatly moved by, that I thought that foreign nations would send ambassadors to the Roman people to procure the abrogation of the law, and of all trials about extortion, for if there were no trials, they think that each man would only plunder them of as much as he would think sufficient for himself and his children. But now, because there are trials of that sort, every one carries off as much as it will take to satisfy himself, his patrons, his advocates, the praetor, and the judges, and that this is an enormous sum, that they may be able to satisfy the cupidity of one most avaricious man but are quite unable to incur the expense of his most guilty victory over the laws. Trials worthy of being recorded. O oh, splendid reputation of our order, when the allies of the Roman people are unwilling that trials for extortion should take place, which were instituted by our ancestors for the sake of the allies. Would that man ever have had a favorable hope of his own safety if he had not conceived in his mind a bad opinion of you? on which account he ought, if possible, to be still more hated by you than he is by the Roman people, because he considers you like himself in avarice, and wickedness, and perjury. And I beg you in the name of the immortal gods, O judges, think of and guard against this. I warn you, I give notice to you of what I am well assured, that this most seasonable opportunity has been given to you by the favor of the gods, for the purpose of delivering your whole order from hatred, from unpopularity, from infamy, and from disgrace. There is no severity believed to exist in the tribunals, nor any scruples with regard to religion. In short, there are not believed to be any tribunals at all. Therefore we are despised and scorned by the Roman people. We are branded with a heavy and now long-standing infamy. Nor, in fact, is there any other reason for which the Roman people has with so much earnestness sought the restoration of the tribunician power. But when it was demanding that in words, it seemed to be asking for that. But in reality it was asking for tribunals which it could trust. But now men are on the watchtowers. They observe how every one of you behaves himself in respecting religion and observing the laws. They see that ever since the passing of the law for restoring the power of the tribunes, only one senator, and he, too, a very insignificant one, has been condemned. And though they do not blame this, yet they have nothing which they can very much commend. For there is no credit in being upright in a case where there is no one who is either able or who endeavors to corrupt one. This is a trial in which you will be deciding about the defendant, the Roman people, about you. By the example of what happens to this man it will be determined whether, when senators are the judges, a very guilty and a very rich man can be condemned. 
on which account in the first place i beg this of the immortal gods which i seem to myself to have hopes of too that in this trial no one may be found to be wicked except he who has long since been found to be such secondly if there are many wicked men i promise this to you judges i promise this to the roman people that my life shall fail rather than my vigor and perseverance in prosecuting their iniquity but that iniquity which if it should be committed i promise to prosecute severely with however much trouble and danger to myself and with whatever enmities i may bring on myself by so doing you marcus glabrio can guard against ever taking place by your wisdom and authority and diligence do you undertake the cause of the tribunals do you undertake the cause of impartiality of integrity of good faith and religion do you undertake the cause of the senate that being proved worthy by its conduct in this trial it may come into favor and popularity with the roman people think who you are and in what a situation you are placed what you ought to give to the roman people and what you ought to repay to your ancestors let the recollection of the Acilian law passed by your father occur to your mind owing to which law the roman people has had this advantage of most admirable decisions and very strict judges in case of extortion i am resolved not to permit the praetor or the judges to be changed in this cause i will not permit the matter to be delayed till the lictors of the consuls can go and summon the sicilians whom the servants of the consuls elect did not influence before when by an unprecedented course of proceeding they sent for them all i will not permit those miserable men formerly the allies and friends of the roman people now their slaves and supplicants to lose not only their rights and fortunes by their tyranny but to be deprived of even the power of bewailing their condition i will not i say when the cause has been summed up by me permit them after a delay of forty days has intervened then at last to reply to me when my accusation has already fallen into oblivion through lapse of time I will not permit the decision to be given when this crowd collected from all Italy has departed from Rome, which is assembled from all quarters at the same time, on account of the Comedia, of the Games, and of the Census. The reward of the credit gained by your decision, or the danger arising from the unpopularity which will accrue to you if you decide unjustly, I think ought to belong to you. The labor and anxiety to me. The knowledge of what is done and the recollection of what has been said by every one to all i will adopt this course not an unprecedented one but one that has been adopted before by those who are now the chief men of our state the course i mean of at once producing the witnesses what you will find novel judges is this that i will so marshal my witnesses as to enfold the whole of my accusation that when i have established it by examining my witnesses by arguments and by my speech then i shall show the agreement of the evidence with my accusation so that there shall be no difference between the established mode of prosecuting and this new one except that according to the established mode when everything has been said which is to be said then the witnesses are produced here they shall be produced as each count is brought forward so that the other side shall have the same opportunity of examining them of arguing and making speeches on their evidence if there be any one who prefers an uninterrupted speech and the old mode of conducting a prosecution without any break he shall have it in some other trial but for this time let him understand that what we do is done by us on compulsion for we only do it with the design of opposing the artifice of the opposite party by our prudence this will be the first part of the prosecution we say that caius verus has not only done many licentious acts many cruel ones toward roman citizens and toward some of the allies many wicked acts against both gods and men but especially that he has taken away four hundred thousand sesterces out of sicily contrary to the laws we will make this so plain to you by witnesses by private documents and by public records that you shall decide that even if we had abundant space and leisure days for making a long speech without any inconvenience still there was no need at all of a long speech in this matter end of section nine recording by philip gould